This is Startup Storefront. Donuts are a stale $40 billion industry, but one company is breathing new life into the vocation. Holy Grail Donuts began their pilgrimage as a burger truck in Kauai, but it wasn't long until they developed a cult following around their taro donuts. Fast forward to today, and they just raised $9 million in funding to open a bunch of shops in LA. And they've even garnished investments from Christopher Costow and Tony Hawk. Part of what makes eating their donuts a religious experience is the fact that they're freshly made with each order. And the unique flavors they offer can only come as a result of divine inspiration. Today, we talk with Holy Grail Donuts co-founder, Niall, about making fresh donuts in his hotel room just before one of the most important pitches of his career, taking a leap of faith by rapidly expanding their locations, and why there's nothing unique from one small donut shop to the next. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Holy Grail Donuts founder, Niall. Thanks for joining. Appreciate you having me. For people who don't know, what's the company? What are you guys, what are you guys making? So at Holy Grail, we're making a really a farm to table, made to order, Hawaii grown taro donut. And we're serving that locally here in Los Angeles now. Walk me from the beginning. Why, what problem did you see in the universe? What was missing? Maybe you're just a food lover. What was the thing where you said, okay, let's, let's start down the road of feeding the people with this delicious thing? Absolutely. Well, if we got time, I guess the road starts way back. Oh, we got um, time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, donuts have always been a really nostalgic product for me growing up. Okay. Um, so that's, you know, that's the first. In Hawaii? Um, or... Growing up in Oregon, actually. Grew okay. up in Eugene, Oregon, and was recruited to Oregon State University for rowing. And about halfway through pursuing ecological engineering at Oregon State, I helped create a donut concept there that was kind of a call it a Domino's pizza, but for donuts, kind of a made to order late night, super bootstrapped donut concept there. And while that was unique and I got to explore that creatively, it really got to show, it really showed me the ins and outs of the more traditional donut industry, which really didn't align with, you know, the reasons why I was pursuing ecological engineering. Give me a window into that. Who, who, who's like the, the, the dominator in the donut? Is it Dunkin' Donuts? Who's the player? So the players are really people behind the curtain, which is the the suppliers and the producers, such as Don Foods. Okay. They're like probably the one of the main ones, and they are providing you know everything from donut mixes to glazes to frying oil to all the donut shops, okay. or the majority of donut shops across the U.S. or okay. globally. So Dunkin' Donuts is like a buyer of one of those products, several of those products. Let's yeah, say. I mean, Dunkin' Donuts and Krispy Kreme are like the two exceptions that do have their own supply chain. Okay. But then these other vendors produce for all the other mom and pop shops. And that was kind of the wake up call, or I guess the calling for me was that I had realized that all these donut shops that were, you know, kind of doing something creatively with a donut or advertising it, they, they were really masquerading as something that they're not. And that was the inspiring part. You know, you're adding all these interesting, like we put a local blueberry glaze on our donut and now it's a local donut. But the DNA of the donut itself is still a 28 ingredient sure. premix bought from Don Foods that's fried in hydrogenated vegetable oils. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that I looked to unlock. Okay, that's fascinating. How big is this industry? Uh, it's over $40 billion market size globally. That's a big So it's that's bigger big than most people would, would think. Okay, and then what was your first step in terms of uh, maybe, like what, how did you stumble into the tarot? Yeah, so, so I had that concept in Oregon. And because of misalignment around the product and ethos, I was able to share my own, uh, sell my ownership to my business partner okay. there. And that allowed me to move out to Hawaii where my sister Hana was actually living and working as a private chef uh, many years before I moved there. And that's kind of where we began to kind of collaborate on this concept and begin to test it. And is she in terms of like, is she like a pastry chef or was she, was this just like a deviation, but it's still interested, still trying to make something delicious? Yeah. Neither of us have any formal training um, yeah. in culinary. It's always been, you know, we have always cooked at home. It's been a huge passion okay. uh, for both of us, but, but no formal training at all. And I, I think that's why we're able to develop something yeah. so new is because we weren't you yeah, know, you're reliant outsider. on any existing structure. And so then you guys started with a truck? We did. So moved out. I needed a way to kind of make income. I, you know, didn't really have much. So I ended up using what I had gained from the previous business. And I purchased a burger trailer in Hanalei, which is the furthest north town of Kauai. And I purchased it mainly because of the location. And it was just, 
an already existing business that was generating some revenue. I could go in and flip burgers and make an income while developing this donut concept. So that allowed myself the flexibility, time, and resources to work with How many with years Hana. ago? How many years ago was this? Uh, 2018. 20, so started. not long, five years ago. I moved to Kauai in 2017. Okay. So it's been a, been a fast paced. Yeah, that's journey. amazing. So and you COVID. were flipping, so you had this burger truck and you were utilizing it as a burger truck and then later on had to convert it to a donut truck, right? What? Yeah. How much of a difference is there in terms of, because you're not using a, a grill, for mm -hmm. the for the donuts like how much of a of a build out did you have to do to this burger truck to convert it quite a bit it was a grind so there was a six month period where you know i was making burgers five days a week and i just had one other employee working with me working the window i was cooking everything and i was working that job and then on the weekend uh, my sister and myself we'd come in at 4 a.m we would load up the back of my pickup truck with all of the donut equipment and then at 4 a.m. in the morning, we'd take all the burger equipment out of the truck, put all the donut equipment in the truck, you know, new gas, everything. And then we'd sell donuts for the weekend. So the truck would actually transform every single weekend I love into that. this donut concept. Yeah. And you had then, flexible real estate. Exactly. So it, it allowed us to spend, you know, less than $2,000 to start start Holy Grail. And what would you see? So what were people, people lining up? What was the thing where you were like, oh, we, ha we might have something here? Honestly, it happened day one. We, through the development of the product, we worked with local farmers and artists in the area to source all the ingredients because the vision was to create a donut product that's completely ground up by the resources of the community we're around. So, you know, the big light bulb moment was this truck is parked across the street from the largest taro field in the state. So, of course, yeah. taro donut. And then as far as yeah. <laughs> naturally, yeah, obviously. I mean, you probably could have found on. a pineapple farm too. <laughs> exactly. and that that exactly. wouldn't have made sense. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, and then all the, all the garnishes, everything that went on the donut was sourced from other farms in the area as well. Okay. And there was a lot of, you know, I would say a, a, a massive psychological approach that went into developing the actual menu and the brand and in terms of care, in the terms rotation of care, um, the collaborations maybe. That too, but also from a consumer standpoint, our menu is developed to actually create some habitual behavior is what we're hoping to do because it's a product that you can eat, not, not feel like shit afterwards. Um, but also we change the menu every single week and that's kind of what allowed the us. The whole thing? Uh, all of the flavors. So, so no, you don't keep a single staple? So now we do, now in, the, do. in the storefront. at the time, okay. And we still have what we call our tasting box, which is four donuts. So we, most donut shops have 28 flavors or so. We started with only four, yeah. and we'd rotate those four every single weekend based wow. off of se purely based off of seasonality, yeah. which had us in this just vicious creative cycle every week, yeah. thinking about what... And a know, lot of testing. You're seeing a lot of data. What are we going to serve next week? We have to yeah. develop four new flavors, yeah. go visit farms, go visit markets, find new ingredients. How and, long did you do that for out of the truck? Uh, so we did that. I mean, we still do it to this day, honestly, but the truck was the burger truck and Holy Grail for a solid six months okay. until we gained venture capital investment. And then we did the full conversion. You know, Holy Grail is the future. The burgers were just a stepping stone. Were people upset to lose the, the burgers? Some people were for yeah. sure, but, but the donuts definitely had developed a, you know, legitimate yeah. movement behind them. In the so at what point sure. do you think this is something that can be venture backed? Like what's going off in your head where you're starting to see things that from a VC perspective or, or just an investment perspective really, you know, is captivating. What's the thing that you saw? What is the thing that you felt was missing uh, as it relates to sort of how things are today versus mm -hmm. what you're the world you're trying to create. What did what did like a, walk me through sort of like the deck, the 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 secret sauce, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean it was very con it was still at a very conceptual stage, but I had always wanted to pursue growth with this concept, so it, it was always supposed to grow. I didn't know how. I didn't know what a venture capitalist was at the at that time. So I was actively seeking some form of investment, just to humbly start off and get a storefront. Mm -hmm. And as those conversations developed and just nothing felt right, there were, was a ton of interest locally um, from local celebrities or other business owners, but just everybody wanted too much. Locally to Hawaii. Locally to Hawaii. Okay. Um, and what happened was Kevin Rose 
uh, from True Ventures, founder of Dig. Uh, he was visiting Kauai and he had like a 12 hour old donut and that sparked him requesting to have lunch with me the next day. So he loved it. He loved it. He loved the product, loved the donut. He was deep in the biohacking phase in that time. So it was honestly an honor that he even tried the donut. I think he was resistant at first. And we got sushi the next day. And I was able to just tell him about the concept about, you know, changing, you know, the donut industry by developing this from ground up and taking a completely different approach to the menu Mm -hmm. and the sourcing. And he asked if I could go pitch his partners that Friday, which was two days later on Big Island. And I didn't have anything. I mean, like no deck, like right. nothing, just no, the donut, yeah, just the product and the dream. Pretty much nothing at that point. I, I love mean, it. I, I had our donuts costed out. And I are you nervous? Like, What's going on inside of you? Yeah. You're like, oh my two God, are you, are you at all flustered? It, are you kind of like, what the it fuck? It was pretty freaky, but at the same time, like, what did I have to lose? I wasn't pursuing venture capital. Did you it sleep? Wasn't, uh, hardly. <laughs> yeah, well, I, was I wasn't say. sleeping much. Because every scenario was going to run through your head at that night. Um, yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah, I wasn't sleeping much uh, back then in general, so it was that wasn't new. <laughs> <laughs> but because I didn't really have a pitch prepared, I ended up packing up a couple Costco bins and throwing fryers, taro, all the ingredients and equipment necessary to make our donuts. And I flew out to Big Island two days later all with all the stuff to make the donuts in a hotel at a tech conference and I ended up showing up to the pitch 15 minutes late, but Power I was, wow. yeah, <laughs> but wow. I was uh, frying donuts in the hotel room before the pitch. So I showed up to the pitch with uh, three tasting boxes of fresh, crispy, beautiful donuts. And had Kevin prepped his partners in any way? Or like, I'm not did, sure. So they see donuts show up mm-hmm. in a room and they're probably thinking, what on earth is this? And then, are you just like try it? Are you telling them the tarot piece? What's the what are you what are you leading that conversation with? It was really a bit of everything. It, it was my experience in the donut industry prior. It was our bootstrapped approach that was purely driven towards passion for the product, and it was also the development of the concept from really an operator's perspective. You know, everything from the equipment to the menu had to be developed in the constraints of a 12 by 8 food truck, Mm -hmm. which there's something at scale now that we look back, that's a really beautiful thing that allowed us to have maximum like punch with the product and the menu and the experience within such a tight constraint, Mm -hmm. um, such minimal equipment necessary to produce this product. And that was a, that was a really big part of it. But of course, just trying the just fresh donut was, yeah. was the main thing. And then what happened? So then are they like, okay, we're in, are they starting, are you giving the strategy around, we're going to follow an art, like a, a brick and mortar strategy. W- what does that look like? Yeah. Like, yeah. Was that always so clear to you or, or, or is that something was that developed sort of trucks? The brick and mortar was, yeah. you know, at the time that just seemed like the obvious approach, like, okay, yeah. we started in a food truck mm-hmm. um, with no investment. Now it's time to take investment and open a Start brick and mortar. Start up to store Right. Yeah. And, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that, that was really the main, main point of the pitch. Like we, we need to solve some proof points. We need to see what this looks like in a storefront form. And then eventually we need to go to a larger market because you know, you can't pour that much investment into this little concept in Kauai because you don't know how, you don't know what's going to happen when that concept hits LA or a larger market like Honolulu. Yeah. Um, so we ended up getting a term sheet that day, uh, right oh, after, wow. like on the spot of the pitch. I'm just curious in terms of like valuation here, what is, <laughs> cause it's a food product. It's, is it, is it's not really CPG, mm-hmm. right? What, what does a donut company like yours fall into? So it was structured similarly to the blue bottle investment actually, because true ventures was one of the leads there and they had just come off of um, that deal with blue bottle and Tony Conrad, who led the investment for Holy grail, uh, was the lead for Blue Bottle. So Got that it. was kind of Got it. So he's well-versed. Yeah. And so then what's your first location here in LA? So first location was Santa Monica on Main Street. We opened that. Um, Natalia with Curado did a beautiful job building it. Yeah. And we opened that this past December. And then recently, this February, we opened on Larchmont. And how's it going? What's going on? What are you learning about this market compared to LA? What are the signals telling you? Is it a smash? How's the menu doing? It's going really well. I I think that there's there's obvious alignment with the product. People care about ingredients that they're ingesting here. They care about where things come from and how they're produced. And so I think the artisan aspect of our product is really 
being appreciated. There's, of course, like a big educational leap that needs to be made in, from in the traditional sense? donut industry. The just because of the tarot or what's the... Tarot, most people here don't know what it is. Okay. So that's a huge, huge piece. Tell people, tell people what it is so, so they know that yeah, if absolutely. they're listening. So taro is a root crop. It's very important in Hawaiian in Hawaiian culture. It's it's traditionally one of the staple foods, um, along with like historically rice was. And taro is this just beautiful root crop that's grown in flooded fields, similarly to rice, and it essentially shoots up into these multiple beautiful heart shaped leaves. So if you go to Hanalei in Kauai, you'll see this incredible mountainscape or landscape with just heart-shaped leaves as far as the eye can go with waterfalls and mountains surrounding. And so we use, you know, the actual root of the crop. It's similar to a potato, but it's much higher in antioxidants. It's poisonous when eaten raw, so it actually needs to be boiled and then it needs to be, traditionally it's pounded. So traditionally it's boiled, then it's hand pounded and fermented, and that's poi. So we use a form of that in our dough, uh, and that's what gives our dough more of a savory, less sweet, slight chew to it, but also some crispiness. So it's just allowed us to develop this just completely unique product. Okay, so that's some education in the market. Any, is it gluten-free? Is it, obviously it's vegan. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. it's all plant-based. Yeah. We, we do have like a flavor every now and then. We'll put honey on it, but we'll label that. Uh, taro itself is gluten-free. We are striving to have a donut that is a donut. So there is a little bit of gluten in it. There's a little bit of taro uh, nut instead of a taro There's a little nut, bit of flour. Dough, yeah. I mean, you you could make one that's gluten-free, but it, it wouldn't have all of those like really special nostalgic mm -hmm. textures. When it comes to scaling, and so are you still using the same supplier, the, the farm across the street? Are they big enough to supply you know, you today and then your expansion plans? Absolutely. We we, act, okay. we currently have three okay. um, that we work with. So our Oahu locations use an Oahu supplier. Our Hanalei location uses a Kauai farmer. And in Los Angeles, we use a multitude of both. Okay. So we really spent the past two years cracking our supply chain to alleviate any of the vulnerabilities that, that came up of, you know, the COVID crisis. So now we own the majority of our whole supply chain as a company, uh, which we had to expedite, you know, this was a very early stage to do that. And it's a large investment. It makes sense though, mm -hmm. for scale. And then will you, so just to go back to the original thing you mentioned, where there's like one sort of large supplier, do you envision yourselves becoming your own supplier also in the sense of you're selling, you know, you're selling the dough, like or, a crispy not the cream, dough, but like the, like, whatever the, the box. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, oh, as in like wholesaling our donuts themselves or not, even, but just in the grocery store, like being like, Hey, have your own Holy Grail donuts, make them gotcha. at home type of thing. I, I do think that there's a CPG angle. Yeah. Um, I don't think that it's this product though. Okay. Um, I, okay. I pulled this product sacred. We, we make it to order yeah. so much training and development goes into every team member that makes it, you know, it's. A really fair comparison is Blue Bottle Coffee, actually, or, or any third wave coffee shop that, that went from bulk drip coffee to artisan pour overs made fresh with freshly roasted coffee. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what we are in the donut industry. You know, we're, we're just like just like somebody making your pour over to order. We're making your donuts to order. And wow. it's hard to put that level of trust even into the consumer to make the product right yeah. um, or other businesses. And... That doesn't mean that there won't be products down the road that are slightly adjusted for a CPG route. One of the hardest things that we had to do for this podcast is something so simple, it's to get chairs. We had been using these plastic chairs and they just weren't cutting it. And not only were they ugly, but they were also massively uncomfortable. So when we had the founders of Sundays on the podcast, it only made sense for us to get new podcast chairs. So they shipped us a set of count on me dining chairs. So if you're interested in upgrading your chairs too, whether that be in your house, office, podcast studio, or anywhere in between, check out the link in the description to pick some up yourself. We can't recommend Sunday's chairs enough. You said sacred, and it reminded me like, uh, how did you come up with the name? Because, you know, it's so, I love the, the branding and, and the website, everything like you have on there is just filtering down from the the religious aspect of Holy Grail. Yeah, the mm -hmm. chalice, the, the pilgrimage to, to these stores. Uh, so what other names did you consider and, and how did you land on Holy Grail? Thank you. Yeah, we had a lot of fun with it, still do. 
We didn't consider any other names. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> was it divine that was easy. In- inspiration? Yeah. I mean, it was an accumulation of things. It, it was most, mostly, most of the credit goes to my mom, actually, who does work within the company. And I put the E in it is kind of how we, we developed it. That, um, but the idea was we're, we're going to completely flip the whole donut experience on its head. And it's the holy grail of donuts. And it's honestly... Looking back, it's really surprising that nobody has really utilized that name. You know, this is one of the most it important objects yeah. in, in human history. Yeah. And it symbolizes so much, you know, so many positive things, and nobody's really used it before. So it's just perfect for what we're trying to do. And so this year, you want to open how many stores? So this year, we're hoping to open one more storefront and two food trucks. However, next year, we really want to get into cadence to where we can open a significant amount of uh, stores. You can pump them out. Yeah. Yeah. What other cities are you eyeing? Right now, Los Angeles is is where our focus is. We would like to take this concept to Asia as well. Where? Where in Asia? Um, Specifically, Japan, initially. Yeah. I was thinking Cambodia. Just Why not? (laughs) <laughs> well, I know that. So yeah. I, I worked on a documentary called The Donut King. It was about a Cambodian. Oh, you worked? I love that. You know that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So I was yeah. I was a drone pilot for all of that. <laughs> Amazing. And what I learned about. He gained from, 40 pounds on that. <laughs> I bet. It was a lot of donut eating. It was great. It's a beautiful film. It is. It, it turned out so well. But what I learned about that was that this guy, he came over from Cambodia, immigrated during the um, the massacre over there. And when he came over here, he found that our donut culture so closely resembled something that they had back in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. And that's why he fell in love with it. And then once he opened up his shop, he started funneling money into other Cambodian refugees to come over and open their own donut shops. And so like when I think of you trying to expand into Asia, I would think Cambodia would be a very receptive market for you. It could be super interesting. To be honest, I don't That's know. Too, I don't know enough about Cambodia, but I've always yeah. wanted to visit. Japan, I love. Japan um, seems to make sense to me. Their coffee culture is next level. And so, when you yeah. talk about the blue bottle, the level of care, mm-hmm. Japan, Tokyo, easily comes to mind. I mean, the level of care there is. I would. I mean, there's nothing like it in the world. Absolutely. And, and so and, I've always been extremely attracted to that. And that's, yeah. You know, even our, our packaging is just like tight and beautiful and concise, and the product is small but satisfying. You know, and there's a lot of artistry that goes into it. We, you know, we tweezer edible flowers on our donuts. It's just oh, wow. like, I feel like the cult, the culture there would really appreciate oh, it. 100%. And so you walked in here, you saw a food truck. What is your food truck going to look like? What are the trucks? What's the vibe? So we're currently going through some thoughts around how we redesign our food truck because they've kind of been a mixed match. They've just been very opportunistic as far as finding one. Uh, working with the existing layout and design and now we're in an opportunity to where we can actually design one from scratch so that's currently on the table you know this our original location which is one of our best performing units is still a red burger trailer like with it has our old logo on it still and it 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 doesn't need to be anything else so uh, now we're, you know, that works for Hawaii, but now we're thinking, how do we, how do we educate people um, yeah, here? That's smart. And then you got Tony Hawk on board. Uh, obviously he's probably invested in a million things, but he's obviously taken a liking to you and the brand and he's public about mm-hmm. his interest. Um, what has it been like working with him? What have you loved? Obviously he was at the, he was at the opening in Larchmont. Yeah. Yeah. What, is it, what has it been like working with Tony? Very casual. Tony is just, I, I guess exactly how. I hoped he would be, <laughs> uh, you know, I, you say don't meet your heroes and yeah. Tony is, is, does, does not reflect that at all. He's, he's just a beautifully humble person, um, who's very down to earth and he loves the product. It's he's a skateboarder. Really he's as grounded. simple as that. That's, yeah. that's the relationship. That's great. Mm-hmm. And then when you think about sort of your journey, so five years ago, right, roughly you were doing this burger, 4am mm-hmm. wake up, transforming it to what you have today. What do you think about the next five years? How, like, what do you think changes for you? Is it, so at that point you're in Asia, you're in probably more markets in America. What does Mm -hmm. it look like? The CPG brand has started. How do you view that? Yeah, we want to keep growing this as long as it doesn't compromise the product or experience. I'm sure that's a cliche and many brands say it, but, but it's authentic and genuine to us. 
and we believe we've unlocked the supply chain and team training and unit economic challenges that would prevent us from keeping this authentic. And now we feel genuinely confident in our ability to, to take this you know, towards 100 locations. So yeah. that, that's what the next five years would locations. look like to us. That's yeah. great. How and many did Blue Bottle uh, end with before uh, Nestle bought them? I believe they were under 100. So Nestle in general loves you know, powderizing everything. And so mm -hmm. Blue Bottle, oddly enough, is working on like the the I almost like the iced latte, but in powder format. And yeah. I forget who their savant is in the coffee community, but he believes they've nailed it. They've hit the holy grail, so to speak. Absolutely. Um, when you think about that angle, that vector for for what you're doing on the donut side, do you see opportunities there to to powderize things, to sort of make things more efficient without compromising? Uh, I certainly do, especially when it comes to our drink program. I'm what is your drink program today? So our drink program is honestly just as unique as the, as the donuts. So my, the last donut business I was uh, involved in had a hand pull lever, like mm -hmm. classic traditional espresso machine. And I loved it just personally, I would geek out about it. I would make, you know, all the lattes, but then I was the one stuck working all the shifts because training people to use the machine and training them to produce a product, you know, the quality that we would expect is, you know, it's just that there's a reason why that's a whole nother business on its own. Yeah. Uh, so I came to the realization that we're, we're never going to be the best coffee shop and donut shop in the world. So we need a product for beverage that complements the donuts and doesn't really add to the complexity of the unit itself. So we developed a purely tap based beverage program. So we make our own cashew coconut milk in house and we actually keg it and nitrogenate it and serve it like a Guinness out of taps. And then that's like the building block for the rest of our drinks. So you can make a draft latte, a draft matcha latte, chai latte, what we call a cacao latte. That's a business onto itself. Yeah. I to think be so. Honest. Yeah. And so you can make them all in 15 And what milks seconds. do you use? Is it always cashew? We you... only have that one type of milk. You know, there's, in everything. Yeah, there's a lot of focus towards oat milk, but, you know, and, and, and we get a lot of people who ask, but then we just give them a sample of our cashew coconut milk and it's better. Well, that's objective. Oatly's fault. They just did a lot of marketing. Yeah. That's yeah. all that is. There's no substance there, mm -hmm. if we're being honest. And how much is a donut? If I go in there and get one or get a box, what are the costs? So one donut is $4 uh, and it's made to order fresh for you in under four minutes. Uh, if you get our tasting box and that's the four rotating donuts of the week, we discount a dollar. So our tasting box is $15. And then our nine pack uh, shown here, that's choose any of the donuts you want on the menu. And that's $32, which is the equivalent of one one free donut. And I know you guys do some form of collaboration sometimes. Is that a monthly basis thing? We do. Yeah. It's a relatively new, new thing. We call it breaking bread and Perfect. that's Look our that. version. Everything just fits. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, yeah, it's very, it, it all stems. We from, spent a lot of names. We of shouldn't be shocked that you've thought this through, but yeah. it's always nice when someone <laughs> right. thinks it through and exactly. it, it's like, of course it's, it's called it's breaking bread. It's the little bread. touches yeah. that yeah. really yeah. make a difference. All right. So breaking well, bread, you. you're collaborating, who you're collaborating with, when, how often, Absolutely. Breaking Bread is a collaboration to develop a new donut flavor. And, you know, we've developed over 70 on our own just through changing the menu every week. And, you know, I think we could still get another 70 in, but it's certainly harder every time to develop more. Yeah. And Breaking Bread is a collaboration to make a donut flavor with a chef or a personality we admire, anybody who wants to work with us and 20% of the proceeds of that flavor for the month goes towards a charitable organization of their choice. And the, one of the more recent ones was one with Tony Hawk yeah. where we developed a donut with I heard him. he made a pretty boring one though. It was a pretty boring donut. It was uh, a, <laughs> it was a something. classic, a classic. It was a classic. That's what I meant to say. It's very PC. Classic. Yeah. Let me rephrase that as classic. <laughs> He's a classic guy, and his favorite flavor was the our original Sin donut, which is See, just the, the, the original the, Sin. Like, like I said, yeah. And what was the yeah. charity Everything. that he chose? Uh, he chose so it's um, the skate park project. Oh, perfect. Uh, which is yeah. yeah. So it was it was phenomenal, and we had a we had a blast. I'm gonna try one. I mean, you got to try both. Rip what do they call? I'll give, try the other half. Give them. Give me the <laughs> so name. That is our uh, Hail Mary donut. Hail Mary. Another with a name. <laughs> Full of grace. <laughs> and thank you. Okay. Cheers. The Hail Mary. Cheers. We just donut bumped. Yeah. So. Oh, you hear that crunch? Yeah, ASMR. That ASMR. 
So this is just our made-to-order taro donut, but it's Ooh, dipped lavender. in a is that lavender? crushed cardamom. So it's a crushed cardamom pod glaze. That's what I meant. Uh, <laughs> with rose petal. I like the, the crunch. Yeah, so they got... And it, and if you... You know, this is like an hour old, this box. So if you got them directly out of the store, it's even... That's really good. I love the crunch. It's good. Yeah, so that's our original sin. You guys go for that one. Original sin. And that is our... This is the one I had earlier. Just classic so, so flavor. Good. Nick loves donuts, by the yeah. way. I, I have a problem. So that is vanilla bean that's grown in Oahu. So all the vanilla we get is sourced locally in Hawaii. Mm. And that's also the maple I was talking about earlier. So it's just maple, vanilla bean, salt, just everything good. This is what I love about good. investing in general. It's like, when you know, you know. Yeah. It's like, not that hard. Yeah. You try it. Is it good? It's great. It's it's everything. Is the four minutes a big issue in terms of throughput or no? I know a lot of people have gotten a large amount. A lot of people, we get texts with pictures mm -hmm. of the line, which is a happy problem. But do you do you worry about it? Or is it like, obviously ice cream shops have that problem too. I'm not too concerned about it. I mean, we've done massive days with the equipment we have and there reaches a point to where if you have a good flow of people coming in the location you just have the donut robot kicking out donuts non-stop and you're making them fresh so you're the only place with a robot we're not there's a couple other companies that do it however mm -hmm. those pieces of equipment are designed predominantly to work with these pre-mixes i was talking about earlier yeah. so you know you got a team of food scientists and engineers actually developing donut mixes with yeah nasty stuff in it to work specifically with this equipment. So we developed our recipe and I think we're the only company in the world who's like actually developed every ingredient specifically to work with this piece of equipment in house. What's the maximum amount of donuts you're able to, to make an to hour per day? <laughs> yeah, well, that's a different number. <laughs> yeah, per that's, true. Hour, that's a good question. Uh, about 32 dozen. A lot. That's a, quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, yeah, quite a bit. And the nice thing is if, if we ever outgrow that number, uh, you can get a larger piece of equipment that doubles it. Right? So what's next? Are you guys raising capital now? We currently are. Yes. An A round? Is it a, what is it? We're, yeah, it's, it's currently, uh, kind of neither. Um, okay. you know, we, we were thinking series B, but just given the market conditions and the fact that we don't need as much as we thought to get the proof points that we want to get for the next 18 months. So yeah. um, currently we're, we're looking to raise like an A plus at the moment. Okay. Private equity. Yes. Food yeah. groups. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have it, you have the model, you have, let's call it the chef or like this, this, the thing. Well, look, where can people support you? Where can, where can they go? Uh, obviously Santa Monica, Larchmont online. Absolutely. Please check out our Instagram page. Holy with an E grail donuts. And you can check out where our food truck is going to be throughout the week. We're doing a lot of events, farmers markets in the LA area, trying to build community um, support. And then uh, our large bond and Santa Monica location here, as well as our Hawaii locations. And if you check out our app, you can skip that line oh, that you're talking app. about. And, and pre-order. You can pre-order. You can get your donuts delivered to you all through our app. It's a seamless process. And uh, what's the, the app called? Holy Grail. Just Holy Grail Donuts. Okay. Come up on the App Store or Android Store. Yeah, that's what I'd recommend. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks th for joining. I really appreciate having you on the show now. Thank you both for having me. It's been great. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over a hundred episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.